So my name is Dick Pease. I'm a Vietnam veteran and a graduate of Hardin Northern here. I am the third child of Lois and Wayne Pease, all of whom went to Hardin Northern here. All of my brothers and sisters went to Hardin Northern here. My father, Wayne Pease, was raised in Dunkirk, uh, went to Dunkirk School. My mother was raised in Blanchard Station, and so my mother, Lois, also went to Dunkirk. Uh, they, they both graduated from uh, Dunkirk High School. I, I uh, attended grade school at the Dunkirk. There, Anyway, I, I had gone through the first eight grades in the Dunkirk building. The Hardin Northern, the, the Dolan and Dunkirk had been incorporated together uh, a year or two before that, I think, and, and I remember attending uh, my freshman year at the Dolan building for two-thirds of that, that year, and then we actually moved into this new building at that time. So that was, uh, I don't know when that was, but that was a long time ago. <laughs> So that, but that was, that was when Hard Northern was created. So after graduating from uh, Hard Northern, I started going to the Lima branch of Ohio State University. At that time, my, my first year there at the Lima branch was actually the second year that that, ex that branch existed. Uh, all of the classes were held in the Lima Senior High Building uh, in the evenings, from from four to ten in the evening, so it was a basically going to night school. You won't believe this, but the tuition at that time for a quarter was uh, either 110 or 120 bucks a quarter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I went to the branch in Lima for uh, two years, and then went down to Ohio State's main campus. Uh, for my last years, and graduated from Ohio State in the spring of 1966. Was likely going to be drafted. I had a very high draft number, so I was definitely going to be drafted. So, so I decided after graduating from Ohio State, I would apply for Navy OCS, Officer Candidate School, uh, and was accepted there. So I attended the Officer Candidate School in Newport, Rhode Island, that the fall of 66 and graduated there in December of 66, 1966. In January, I started my naval career. Was assigned to the USS Tripoli, which is a, um, a helicopter carrier. The Tripoli had a battalion of Marines aboard uh, and a squadron of of helicopters and was stationed out of San Diego on the west coast. This was the beginning of um, the Vietnam War. We were, you know, by that time, uh, had been involved there for two or three years anyhow. So there was a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of activity on the west coast with uh, ships out of uh, San Diego. This ship is the Tripoli. The other two ships uh, are a cargo ship and an LSD, uh, which was a smaller ship. The Tripoli uh, was a helicopter carrier called an LPH. It was 600 feet long, about 20,000 tons displacement. My job on there was the gunnery officer, the gunnery division officer, I should say. I had a uh, division of uh, about 20 people, about 20, 20 guys, uh, um, two-thirds of them were gunner's mates and the other third of them were fire control technicians which were more technical radar type people. When you're on board a ship and at sea you've, you've got basically a day job which is your, your overall responsibility in my case, being the gunnery division officer, was to supervise these 20 or so guys 
make sure the gun mounts worked and, and that sort of thing, and that's what you dealt with all day. But then you also have a, a watch uh, uh, or a duty station. You would normally stand a watch for, for four hours at a time. And in most cases, when we were at sea, we were on a rotation where you'd be on that watch one out of every three watches. So if you were on for four hours, you were off for 12, and then, excuse me, off for eight, and then back on for another four hours. So, and, and that constantly rotated around the clock so that between your, your day job and your duty station or, or watch station, you didn't get a lot of sleep. <laughs> so, and then also in the Navy, you have a battle station, which is when the, the ship is actually at general quarters and, and dealing with enemy fire and that sort of thing. Didn't really have that uh, much on the Tripoli. So when I got to the Tripoli, got there in January of 67, uh, we did a little training and then headed to Westpac, uh, Western Pacific, which was Vietnam. We carried a battalion of Marines and a uh, squadron of helicopter carriers, he helicopter uh, ships um, that, that transported the Marines to the beach. And we operated, uh, we were usually deployed for six or seven months, the Vietnam area, and then would be back, come back to the States for five or six months, uh, do, do some training, and then head back again. So I had actually uh, was on the ship for almost 22 months. I had made, had just begun my third deployment to Vietnam on the ship when I left the ship to go to boat school, swift boat school. So while I was on the Tripoli, I became a qualified officer of the deck underway, which means for four hours, you're the guy on the bridge actually controlling the movements of the ship, right full rudder, full speed ahead, all of that sort of thing, you know. You're actually the guy that's in charge of moving the ship. It's a pretty exciting thing. My immediate boss encouraged me, unlike most of the other junior officers that, that were ensign JGs at the time, my boss encouraged me to do things like that, and, and so it turned out you know, to be very rewarding. Uh, so it was it was a lot of fun driving a, a 600 foot, 20,000 ton vessel, particularly in a war zone where there was a lot of stuff going on. We operated in the pretty much the northern half of Vietnam, from the DMZ down to Da Nang area. That was our primary area of operation. There were various marine operations going on, so we ha we had you know helicopters deploying round the clock. And we were just sitting off the coast anywhere from four or five miles to eight or ten miles off the coast of Vietnam, up and down the coast. And the ship also had a hospital, a bay on it. There, there was an operating room, a hospital area where the, the wounded Marines would be brought back, cared for, and medevaced if, if possible. Uh, this is the... the commanding officer of the Tripoli uh, uh, right before I left the Tripoli. They, because it was a, that was the captain, uh, and this was taken right before I left the ship and when I was going to, heading to boat school. So while I was there, um, off the coast of Vietnam, I could see these little swift boats running around. They were also patrolling the coast. The, the swift boats are 50-foot aluminum craft, had about a 20-ton displacement. They were at the time being used to patrol the coast and, and help prevent the contraband from moving from the north to South Vietnam. They would smuggle stuff down in trawlers and various vessels and along the coast and, and slip into the south. So that was, that's how the swift boats were used at the time. Uh, after being on the, the Tripoli for almost two years, I, I would see these guys, it look, they would come alongside, pick up ice cream, 
whatever. And that looked like a fun job. I, I put in to, for Swift Boat School in uh, November of, of 1968. I got accepted to Swift Boat School. We had just begun our third deployment to, to Vietnam, so I flew out of Da Nang back to the States to San Diego to go to the Swift Boat School. That was about a six-week process, I guess. So I, after graduating from the Swift Boat School, was sent to Vietnam. I had made, Swift Boats had five bases up, up along the coast, all along the coast of South Vietnam with this. The southernmost base being right on the border of Cambodia and South Vietnam. Place called Ha Chien. The base was actually off the coast on a little village called Antoya on Fuquoc Island. Anyway, so I was sent to that base. I made one patrol, did one coastal patrol. From that point on, the boats had had begun to be used in the rivers. So I, after making them one coastal patrol, everything I did after that was in the rivers. I, I'd gotten there and gotten my boat by mid-February. Mid on March 13, 69, I was on an operation, a five-boat operation, and it, it, it had been going on all, all day long. Uh, we had started out early that day, probably before uh, sunrise, carrying some local Vietnamese, South Vietnamese forces, and inserting them in the rivers in in, in, in BC suspected areas. So we we had finished that operation. We were we were uh, heading out the river to head back to our LST, which was our base of operation at, at that point. The South Vietnamese people down in the southern end of the the country, the Delta, lived off the land pretty much. Uh, they grew rice and other food there, but they most of them ate fish most of the time, and they they got the fish out of the rivers. So they used these net systems uh, to catch the fish, and so the rivers were had these stakes with nets strung between them, and and we tried to avoid damaging their nets uh, when we were going up and down the river. So you would see the stakes and try to figure out which way you go to not tear up their net. So I was the lead boat on this operation, all-day operation. I was the lead boat on one side of the river and another boat on the other side. And then there was uh, a boat behind each of us and a fifth boat in the middle. So I had maneuvered to hopefully avoid the nets, maneuvered by the stakes. As I was passing the stake, a mine went off underneath my boat. The VC were very good at figuring out what we, that we were trying to avoid damaging their nets, so they would set their, their bombs up right in line with those fish sticks and would know exactly when to uh, set them off. My, my boat was literally, now this is a 50-foot boat, 22 tons probably, literally blown straight out of the water, about five feet out of the water. The motor mount, mounts on both engines were broke. One engine was still running uh, at idle speed, uh, and the engines were cooled by pumping seawater uh, through a cooler, but because the engine, my, those engines uh, had, the motor mounts were broken, the engines had moved, the one engine was pumping water into the boat. The water system would normally pump, pump the water th through a cooler and back out on, on the boat, but those things were broke, so it was actually literally pumping, pumping water into the boat. My boat was in danger of sinking, obviously. An interesting thing about my, my, my boat, I had, I had the three boat. Now the swift boats, there were somewhere around 150 of them made. My boat was actually one of the very first two boats ever sent to Vietnam. The number one boat and number two boat were in San Diego used as training boats. So the three boat and the four boat were the first ones to get to Vietnam. So my boat was the oldest one there, which turned out to be a good thing because what happened was, a few years earlier, the swift boat generally developed this problem of corrosion. They were all aluminum boats. The ribs of, of the, the boat were beginning to corrode 
from electrolysis created by the engines and so forth, something that somebody didn't anticipate. But as a result of that, my boat being the, the oldest one, uh, it had been repaired and, and it had been, the, the ribs had all been reinforced with other additional ribs. And that's probably why when we hit the mine that it didn't rupture the hull. So the hull was not ruptured at all. And, and uh, our only problem was sinking ourselves by pumping water with that one engine still idling and pumping water into the boat because we weren't sinking because we had rup a ruptured hull, fortunately. Three of the other boats uh, were, were either beside me or behind me. Of course, everybody, in those instances, when an explosion goes off, the first thing that happens was everybody starts shooting hosing down the, the banks with 50 caliber machine gun fire. And after 20 seconds or so, people stop shooting to see if anybody's shooting back. Once they realize nobody's there shooting back at us, the guys were immediately alongside me, got the other engine shut down. I had some of my crew blown, were blown overboard. I happy, ha happened to be in the driver's seat in the pilot house. My radar man usually would have been driving, but he had been doing that. We had been out for, I don't know, 10 hours, and he was tired of doing that, so I was, was driving. As a result, I was thrown up. Uh, actually, I had a, a helmet on, and it was split in half because I hit my head on the ceiling of the, of the cabin there. I had a puncture in my my cheek, my lap was covered with blood, and I thought, uh, my legs are gone. Uh, when I, you know, it took me a couple seconds to, to um, get the courage to start moving to, to see if my legs were actually damaged, and it turns out all of the blood must have come from my face, uh, just a, a puncture in the side of my my face here, and I, I also had a cracked uh, vertebrae and a pinched nerve in my back uh, and a few other lesser wounds. All the other boats immediately gathered around me. We got the engine shut down, or they got the engine shut down. They picked up some of my crew that had gone overboard, got us, uh, got, got the boat secured, and the one, one of the boats transported myself and others that were wounded out to an LST where we were then uh, medevaced to a hospital. The other guys, the other boats uh, stayed there and eventually towed my boat out, out the river to the LST that we were operating from and eventually uh, got moved to Cameron Bay. Excuse me, that, that's how I got my first Purple Heart. So uh, anyway, I ended up, I got medevaced then and ended up in an orthopedic ward in, uh, I cannot remember the, the base, it was one of the southern, southern areas, uh, medevac hospitals. So it's in this orthopedic ward for several days. What struck me was uh, in that ward were six guys uh, with legs off. At that point, um, uh, 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 the war became very, very real. It, I was at that hospital for uh, seven or eight days, as I recall, uh, and then in the meantime, my boat had been taken to uh, our main base in Cameron Bay, where it was going to be repaired. And I have some pictures of it being hauled into in there, and so we. I was there for probably a, a month with my crew. Uh, we were just basically waiting for our for the boat to be repaired. When it was ready to go again, we went back to uh, the base we had operated out of at Antoy, started started patrolling again. At, at that point. The, uh, the operation had changed. It was strictly, it was, it was completely river operations. We 
had created on one of the larger rivers there a a floating base in the middle of the river had been been created out of pontoons and so forth that we operated from from time to time but we, there were several different rivers that we operated on I continued doing those operations for a couple months and then on July 10th 1969 saw an operation near our base I and another boat we had, we had helicopters that were that were used overhead to to spot enemy action we thought we would go try and investigate it and so forth so there were two boats another one a 35 boat alongside mine beached into an area put our bows on the beach and in a, a very small river disembarked some south vietnamese forces. Uh, these were regional and provincial forces, they were called. They were local Vietnamese forces, South Vietnamese forces. They were kind of like a National Guard unit. They weren't regular South Vietnamese Army. I had disembarked them. One of them apparently tripped a uh, Claymore mine, which was right in front of the boats. I, I was standing in the doorway of the pilot house at that time and uh, got some shrapnel from that in my shoulder. The 35 boat got more of the, the shrapnel that put a bunch of holes in the boat. We immediately, as usual, the, the first reaction for everybody was to start shooting. At, at that point, we had disembarked some of our South Vietnamese troops. They were in danger of getting hit by friendly fire. So I, I immediately started screaming uh, on the radio to cease fire, got them stopped, and and then we were able to load up the the wounded and get back to our base and and get everybody medevaced out again. I ended up going up to a convalescent center in Cameron Bay area. I was there for three weeks or so. Then the uh, Viet Cong actually came in and blew up the hospital. By this time, I had had, I'd, I'd been in hospitals over, over 30 days. The Navy had, had a rule, if you spend more than 30 days in a hospital, or if you get more than three Purple Hearts, or you get three Purple Hearts, uh, you can go home. So I was beginning to think these guys really didn't like me. And... Uh, so I decided to take that option. I ended up leaving Vietnam then. So I went back to the States, was assigned to the, the Swift Boat School as an instructor. And so while I was over in Vietnam, the Swift Boat School had gotten moved from San Diego, San Francisco Bay Area. The north end of San Francisco Bay is where the, the Sacramento River Delta is. The Sacramento River dumps into the north end of San Francisco Bay. And so, as it turns out, that, uh, that river delta was very much like the, the southern part of Vietnam. Just had all of the, it was very flat, uh, a lot of uh, rivers and sloughs, uh, and an area that, that was very similar to South Vietnam. And so, the, the boat school had been moved up there because the operations for, had primarily become river operations. Uh, so I ended up going to the boat school, the swift boat school there in Vallejo. It, it was in Vallejo, California, Mare Island, a place called Mare Island, which was a naval base uh, near, the, near the Sacramento River there. And, and uh, that's where we tra trained the, the boat crews then that were going over to Vietnam. So shortly after getting there, I, I received a Silver Star for, for the action of uh, July 10th. And um, so my time, my three years duty was up in December of 1969, but I had just spent three years in either San Diego or Southeast Asia, and I didn't feel like going back to Ohio in, in the middle of winter. So I ended up extending for six months 
in the Navy and, and stayed there at the boat school. And all of the other guys, uh, the other instructors at the boat school, all had very similar experiences at mine. They had all been to Vietnam. It wasn't a large group. It was 20 guys, 30 guys maybe, instructors at the boat school. Uh, they had all been to Vietnam, uh, had similar experiences. At this point, we all had that behind us, and it was a lot more fun uh, being in the San Francisco area, not having to worry about what's going to happen next, you know. Uh, I continued that for about six months uh, and, until uh, May, I think, of 69 when I uh, left the Navy. And that, that was a lot of fun at that time. We were actually, so we would, when we were training boat crews, we would train them in the rivers there and Sacramento Delta, uh, but also take them out to Golden Gate. And then the amazing thing was we were, <clears throat> I don't know how this ever happened. We were allowed to take the swift boats out on weekends and go out fishing, go out to Golden Gate and go fishing. Or, or drive around San Francisco Bay area. We did a lot of that. It was it was a lot of fun. I remember in the, in San Francisco, uh, the north side of the Golden Gate Bridge is Marin County, a very high end area, beautiful houses, place called Sausalito, right along real close to the Golden Gate. Another very high-end area called Tiburon, a little peninsula that sits down uh, out into the north end of, of uh, San Francisco Bay. There was a, a, a yacht club uh, where very nice fancy yachts would, were, were kept, but also there was, there was a very nice restaurant on the end of Tiburon where all of these fancy yachts would tie up too. So I recall one time um, on a weekend, we took this dirty old gray swift boat and tied up at that restaurant. Got a lot of dirty looks, but uh, it was a lot of fun. So that was that's that's how my naval career ended, is is being at that boat school, uh, being able to uh, drive around San Francisco in a swift boat, and uh, so forth. So I got out of the Navy then, and in the meantime, one of my shipmates from the Tripoli had taken a job in San Francisco as a stockbroker. And uh, I had kept in contact with him. I looked him up, ended up getting a job in San Francisco and down in the financial district, which is where I ended up meeting my wife. So she had, she had moved to the East Bay of, in Oakland area oh, about six months earlier with a girlfriend of hers. She, they were from New Jersey, so they had moved out there and uh, she, Mary ended up getting a job there at, at the same company. I was working for Spreckle Sugar Company, which had a, their main office was in the financial district of San Francisco. So in those days, uh, an office only had one copy machine. And everybody used the same copy machine. So I actually met her at, at the uh, copy machine. San Francisco in in 1970 was not a, a bastion of conservative thought. We weren't always well received. And, and when I you know, started working there, I learned very quickly, don't, don't mention, you know, I, I, I always had short hair, but I never, uh, n never talked much about what I had just mm -hmm. done for the last three years. My father had passed away in 70, late 75. I, uh, needed to come back and kind of watch out for mom and the family uh, for a little bit, intending to go back to San Francisco. Events changed, and uh, we ended up 
moving back in in uh, very late 75 stayed so that's that's how we ended up back home it was, it was a huge change for my wife having grown up in New Jersey Jersey City she actually worked in Manhattan you know commuted in there every day uh, so huge change for her Manhattan to San Francisco to Dunkirk yes <laughs> yes I think she learned to appreciate uh, rural Ohio. If there's just uh, one thing that you would want kids, high school kids nowadays, to understand about uh, just your service or what it means to be in the service or what it meant to serve in Vietnam, what, what would you want, want to say? Uh, my service is life-changing uh, for me. And, um, you know, I would certainly encourage people uh, to consider serving, at least uh, for a while. Now, I, I never intended uh, to stay in the Navy and probably would never have gone had there not been a war going on and, and, a, and, I, and having a high draft number, uh, you know. But I, I think uh, it, it was a great experience for me. You mature very quickly. I was 23, 24, having gone to college first. Uh, I also think that's the way to do it, but that's, you know, to each his own there, I guess. It's had a lot to do with, you know, the rest of my life.